and you've spoken to this, in you thinking about other stuff in the world, it's been very useful to uh, to step away from this illusion of free will. And you argue that it's probably makes a better world because you can be compassionate and empathetic towards others. And toward oneself. And toward toward, oneself. I mean, I mean to, radically toward others in that literally hate makes no sense anymore. I mean, there's certain things you can really be worried about, really want to oppose, really, I mean, it's, I'm not saying you'd never have to kill another person. Like, I mean, self-defense is still a thing, right? But the idea that you're ever confronting anything other than a, a force of nature in the end goes out the window, right? Or w does go out the window when you really pay attention. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is, would be easy to under, to, to grok if, you know, you know, someone kills a member of your family. I'm not saying you can just listen to my 90 minutes on free will and then you should be able to see that person as identical to a, a grizzly bear or a, or a virus. Because uh, there's so, I mean, we are so evolved to uh, deal with one another as, as fellow primates and, and as agents. Uh, but it's, um, yeah, when you're talking about the possibility of, you know, Christian you know, truly Christian forgiveness, right? It's like, like you know, uh, the, as, as testified to by, you know, various um, uh, saints of that flavor over the, over the, the uh, millennia. Yeah, that is it. That, the doorway to that is to recognize that no one really at bottom made themselves. Right. And, and therefore everyone, what we're seeing really are differences in luck in the world. We're seeing people who are very, very lucky to have had good parents and good genes and to be in good societies and had good opportunities and to be intelligent and to be, you know, not sociopathic. Like, it's, none of it is on them. They're just reaping one lot, the, the, the fruits of one lottery after another and then showing up in the world on that basis. Um, and then so it is with you know, every malevolent asshole out there, right? He he, or she didn't make themselves. Even if that weren't possible, the utility for, for self-compassion is also enormous because it's, when you just look at what it's like to regret something or to feel shame about something or feel deep embarrassment about it, mean, these states of mind are some of the most deranging experiences anyone has and and their react the, the the kind of the the indelible reaction to them you know the memory of the thing you said the you know the memory of the wedding toast you gave 20 years ago that was just mortifying right the fact that that can still make you hate yourself right and it, like like that psychologically that is a knot that can be untied Right. Speak for yourself, Sam. Yeah, yeah. So clearly yeah, you, you're not. You gave a great, a great <laughs> toast. It was, it was my toast that mortified. No, 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 that's not what I was referring to. I, 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 I'm deeply appreciative, in the same way that you're referring to, of every moment I'm alive. But I'm also powered by self hate often. Mm. Like several things in this conversation already that I've spoken, I'll be thinking about. Like that was the dumbest thing. You're sitting in front of Sam Harris, and you said that. So like that, but that somehow creates a richer experience for me. Like I've, I've actually come to accept that as a nice feature of however my brain was built. I don't think I want to let go of that. Well, the, the thing you, I think the thing you want to let go of is uh, the suffering associated with it. So like, so for me, so, so uh, it's just very psychologically and ethically, all of this is very interesting. It, so I don't think we ever we should ever get rid of things like anger, right? So like hatred is hatred is divorceable from anger, in the sense that hatred is this enduring state where you know whether you're hating somebody else or hating yourself, it is just it is toxic and durable and ultimately useless, right? Like it becomes it becomes self nullifying, right? You, like you become less uh, capable as a person. To solve any of your problems, it's not it's not instrumental in solving the problem that is it, that is is occasioning all this hatred. And anger, for the most part, isn't either, except as a signal of salience that there's a problem, right? So if somebody does something that makes me angry, 
that just promotes this situation to to conscious uh, conscious attention in a way that is stronger than my not really caring about it, right? And there are things that I think should make us angry in the world, and there the beha- there's the behavior of other people that should make us angry because we should respond to it. And so it is with yourself. If I do something, you know, as a parent, if I do something stupid that harms one of my daughters, right? Um, my belief, my my experience of myself, and my beliefs about free will, close the door to my saying, "Well, I should have done otherwise." In the sense that if I could go back in time, I would have actually effectively done otherwise. No, I would do given the same causes and conditions, I would do that thing a trillion times in a row, right? But you know, re- regret and feeling bad about an outcome are still important to capacities because like, yeah, you know, like I, I desperately want my daughters to be happy and healthy. So if, I, if I've done something, you know, if I, if I crash the car when they're in the car and they get injured, right? Because, and I'm, I do it because I was trying to change the uh, song on my playlist or, you know, something stupid, I'm going to feel like a total asshole. How long do, how long do I stew in that feeling of regret? Right. And to like, do, what utility is there to extract out of this error signal? And then what do I do? We're always faced with the question of what to do next, right? And 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 how to best do that thing, that necessary thing next. And how much well-being can we experience while doing it? Like how much, how miserable do you need to be to solve your problems in life and to solve the problems of, to help solve the problems of people closest to you? You know, how, how miserable do you need to be to get through your to-do list today? Ultimately, I think you can be deeply happy going through all of it, right? And not, and, and even navigating moments that are scary and, you know, really destabilizing to ordinary people and, um, I mean, I think, you know, again, I'm, I'm always up kind of at the, the edge of my own capacities here and there are all kinds of things that stress me out and worry me. And I'm mean, especially something if it's, you're going to tell me it's something with, you know, the health of one of my kids, you know, it's very hard for me, like, it's very hard for me to, to be truly equanimous around that. But equanimity is so useful the moment you're in, in response mode, right? Because I mean, it's the, the, the ordinary experience for me, of responding to what seems like a medical emergency for one of my kids is to be obviously super energized by concern to respond to that emergency. But then once I'm responding, all of my fear and agitation and worry and, oh my God, what if this is really something terrible? But finding any of those thoughts compelling all, that only diminishes my capacity as a father to be good company while we navigate this really turbulent passage. You know, as you're saying this, actually, one guy comes to mind, which is Elon Musk. One of the really impressive things to me was to observe how many dramatic things he has to deal with throughout the day hmm. at work, but also if you look through his life, family too, yeah. and how he's very much actually as you're describing basically a practitioner of this way of thought, which is you're not in control. You're, you're basically responding no matter how traumatic the event. And there's no reason to sort of linger on the, well, yeah, they on the be. negative feelings around that. Well, well, so, I mean, he, but he's in a very specific situation, which is, which is unlike normal life you know, even his normal life, but normal life for, for most people, because when you just think of like, you know, he's running so many businesses and he's, he's, they're very, they're not, they're non, highly non-standard businesses. So what he's seen is everything that gets to him is some kind of emergency. Like it wouldn't be getting to him. If it needs his attention, right. the, there's a fire exactly. somewhere. So, exactly. so he's constantly responding to fires that have to be put out. So there's no default expectation that there shouldn't be a fire. Right, but in our normal lives, we live. Most of us, I mean, most of us who are lucky, right? Not everyone, obviously, on Earth, but most of us who are at some kind of cruising altitude in terms of our lives, 
where we're reasonably healthy and that life is reasonably orderly and the political apparatus around us is reasonably functional, functional, um, functional. So I said functional for the first time in my life through no free will of my own. See, like I notice those errors, and they do not feel like 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 agency, and nor does nor does the success of a, an, an utterance feel like agency. He, when you're when you're looking at normal human life, right, where you're you're just trying to be happy and healthy and get your, your work done. There's this default expectation that there shouldn't be fires. People shouldn't be getting sick or injured. You know, the, the we shouldn't be losing vast amounts of our resources. We should like so when something really stark like that happens, um, people don't have a we, people don't have that muscle that they've like. I've been responding to emergency, emergencies all day long, you know, se seven days a week in business mode and so i have a very thick skin this is just another one what it was like i'm not expecting anything else when i wake up in the morning no we have this default sense that i mean honestly most of us have the default sense that we aren't going to die right or that we should like maybe we're not going to die right like like death denial really is a thing you know we're we, we're because and you can see it just like i can see when i reach for this bottle that I was expecting it to be solid because when it isn't solid, when it's a hologram and I just my fist closes on itself, I'm damn surprised. People are damn surprised to find out that they're going to die, that, to find out that they're sick, to find out that someone that they love has died or is, is going to die. So it's like the, the fact that we are surprised by any of that shows us that we're we're living at a, a we're living in a mode that is um You know, we're, we're perpetually diverting ourselves from some facts that should be obvious, right? And and that and the more the more salient we can make them, uh, you know, the more. I mean, in the case of death, it, it's a matter of of being able to get one's priorities straight. I mean, the the moment that again, this is hard for everybody, even those who are really in the business of paying attention to it. But the moment you realize that every circumstance is finite. Right, you're, you're, you've you got a certain number of you know you've got whatever whatever it is eight thousand days left in a in a normal span of life, um, and eight thousand is a sounds like a big number. It's not that big a number, right? So it's just like, like and then you then you can decide how you want to go through life uh, and how you want to experience each one of those days. And so I was to back to where we, our jumping off point. I would argue that you don't want to feel self-hatred ever i i would argue that you don't want to really uh really grasp on to any of those moments where you where you are take are internalizing the fact that you just made an error you embarrassed yourself that something didn't go the way you wanted it to i think you want to you want to treat all of those moments very very lightly you want to extract the the actionable information it's something to learn. Oh, you know, I, I learned that when I when I prepare in a certain way, it works better than I when I prepare in some other way or don't prepare, right? Like so, like yes, lesson learned, you know, and and do that differently. But um, yeah, I mean, so many, so many, so many of us have spent so much time with a very. Uh, dysfunctional and hostile and even hateful inner voice governing a lot of our self-talk and a lot of just just our default way of being with ourselves. I mean, the privacy of our own minds, we're in the company of, of a, a real jerk a lot of the time. And um, and that that can't help but affect, I mean, forget about just your, your own sense of well-being. It, it can't help but limit what you're capable of in the world w with other people. I'll have to really think about that. I, I just take pride that my jerk, my inner voice jerk is much less of a jerk than like somebody like David Goggins, who's just like screaming mm -hmm. in his ear constantly. So my, I just, right. I, I have a relativist kind of perspective that it's not as bad as that at least. Well, having a sense of humor also helps, you know, it's just like, it's not, the, the stakes are, are never quite what you think they are. And even when they are, I mean, the, it's just the difference be between 
see being able to see the comedy of it rather than right. uh, because because again th there's this sort of dark star of self-absorption that <laughs> pulls everything into it yeah. right and it's like if, if if that that's the that's the algorithm that's the algorithm you don't want to run so, so like it's like you just want you just want things to be good so like just push push the concern right. out there like like the, the, like the, the, not have the collapse of oh my god what does this say about me it's just like let's. What does this say about how do we make this meal that we're all having together as as uh, as fun as po and as useful as possible? And you're saying in terms of propulsion systems, you recommend uh, humor as a good spaceship to escape the gravitational field of the of that uh, darkness. Well, that certainly helps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.